This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Welcome to TWIV. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV. This week in virology, this is episode 466. And today is November 3rd, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are coming to you from the Capsid Club. Yes. (laughs) I just love that name. I've never heard it anywhere else. It's just so creative and I love it. Well, actually the Capsid Club is in Bloomington, Indiana, population 86,000. <laughs> and we, which I looked up, and we are on the campus of Indiana University. And uh, I am here today with my TWIV co-host who is normally from Southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. So I have to tell you, because Rich would think us amiss if we didn't do it, the temperature here in Bloomington is 61 Fahrenheit, which we know is 16 Celsius. And it's a sunny, beautiful fall day on a beautiful campus here in Bloomington. What brings you here, Kathy? Well, it was in part to do the TWIV and in part because... IU is proposing to put in a bid to host a future American Society for Virology meeting. So they wanted to get some input from a former program chair about what's needed at the uh, venues for the meeting itself. So uh, did you fly here from Park? I drove. You drove drove yesterday. How long does it take? A little over five hours. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, it was. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you could listen to podcasts, right? (laughs) No, I don't have a new enough car car for that. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you could make it. Uh, We are actually, normally this would be the Capsid Club, right? Where you, it's a journal, paper, data club? Data Data club, no journals, no papers, good. Data club. And uh, so we are honored to be your Capsid Club for today. And we have a couple of the many virologists here at, at Indiana University as our guest, our esteemed guests. You can tell it's the Capsid Club because there's beer. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the first beer TWIV, right? I don't ever remember having uh, beer on TWIV. And look at, that guy has beer and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Serious. he's going to be moving really quickly. So, All right, so who are these? Uh, individuals on my left, I have to try this. Tuli Mukopadi. It's good enough. No, it's not. What's the right way? So <laughs> you can say Mukupadi or you can say Mukupadi. Oh, Mukupadi. Is that what yes, you like? Yes, that's very good. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you. How would you say my name, by the way? Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> that's what a great answer. It's going to be a good <laughs> So, uh, what about the rest? Would you black and yellow? Just think black and yellow. Black and yellow. Yeah, that's it. Does anyone know the song Black and Yellow? <laughs> yeah, my students always say we think of you when we hear the song, Professor. <laughs> All right, to Tuli's left. I'm going to call you Tuli now for the rest of the time. You can't look at my notes. Oh, <laughs> I'm <damn>. just kidding. <laughs> because you'll know all the questions. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Tuli, uh, next to Tuli, Adam Slotnick. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent. Welcome to Bloomington. Thank you. First time, this is my first time here, as I was saying before. And I've known you for many years, right? Yeah. Study section mostly. Study section mostly. I guess this goes back about 10 years. Maybe more. Maybe, Maybe more. more. Anyway, welcome to TWIV. Um, and to his left, the itinerant virologist. Do you know what that means? <laughs> John Patton. Welcome. Welcome. I see, every time I see you, you're somewhere else, it seems. I, I, I do my best. I do my best. I first met you in Florida. Yes. Do you remember? Yes. University of Miami. Many places. And then NIH, and now you're here in Indiana. Well, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. And these are all first-time 
uh, guests on TWIV. So what's the first thing we want to know about them? You should know the drill by now, no? Background. Where you're from, blah, blah, blah. Yes, so Tuli, <laughs> tell us. All right, you, you can, no, you can't see that part. Wait. <laughs> see, there's your name. Where are you from? So I was born in Winnipeg, Canada, and then we lived in Montreal. And by the time I was um, two, we moved to a suburb of Chicago, and that's where I grew up. And growing up brings you where? What part of your life? High school? Through high um, school? Up, yeah, through high school. And then I went to a small school that's actually close to here called DePaul University. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to graduate school at University of Illinois in Chicago. And then I went for a first postdoc at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And then I did a second postdoc at Purdue. And then I came here. So I've just been in that central time zone mm -hmm. up and down. <laughs> All right, so at grad school, you sorry, where was it again? University of Illinois in Chicago. Chicago. What did you do there? So I was in the chemistry department, and I worked on a group of proteins called annexins, and they bind. So I think annexin 5 is probably the most famous because it binds to phosphatidylserine. Um, so I looked at protein-lipid interactions. So in that chemistry department, we were the most biological lab. I love what people call proteins famous, right? <laughs> They are it's famous. Like, it's Michael among our group, but if you went out on the street, <laughs> <laughs> right? If you asked the person on an elevator, have you ever heard of a Nexon? This is true. It's, I'll work on my elevator talk. We'll, we'll get to that, yeah. Um, and then your, your PhD was in what? It was in biochemistry, in the, and it was uh, in the chemistry department, but biological I chemistry. just asked you that, didn't I? Yep. I'm tired. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> and then... Most. I went to University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, mm -hmm. where I worked on heterotrimeric G proteins. Um, and I was in the Department of Ph Pharmacology with Elliot Ross. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three years. And uh, basically, I reconstituted a signaling pathway. So purified membrane proteins, cytoplasmic proteins, put them in a liposome, and watched them have activity. It was very exciting. That's a nice phrase. I reconstituted a signaling pathway. I like that. You should try that in an elevator. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're in the elevator, it'll be okay. Yes, for anyone here. But uh, I don't hear any viruses yet. I didn't. So while I was there, we had a collaboration with Steve Springs Group, which was a crystallography group. And every time I wanted to make a mutation, I had to go down two flights, talk to someone in there. They had to bring up the structure and tell me what mutation to make or that I could make. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to do that. I got a little frustrated with that. So I wanted to learn structural biology and at the same time, because of personal reasons, I was um, moving to West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, and so I was like, okay, who is a structural biologist at West Lafayette, Indiana? Um, can I go work for this person? So I interviewed with Michael Rossman, and he's like, why should I hire you? And I'm like, your viruses have proteins and lipids. I know about proteins and lipids. And he said, okay, I give you one year. Um, and I ended up staying there for five years, and all my projects, um, even though technically I was Michael's postdoc, all my projects were in collaboration with Richard Kuhn's lab, and so that's where I got my virology training. Mm, okay. So. And did you come here from there? I came here from so there. So how long ago was that, roughly? I came here in May of 2005. Okay. So uh, why Indiana University? Why did you come here? When I applied, biochemistry was trying to expand into structural biology, and biology was trying to expand into virology. And so I felt like that was a good fit for me at the time. Okay. Adam, where are you from? Well, I was uh, born in Massachusetts, but mainly raised in Virginia. And uh, um, uh, for those who know their Civil War history, um, my high school just got renamed Justice High School from Jeb Stewart, which is a really pleasing thing because I couldn't stand the idea of Jeb Stewart High. Um, did my undergrad at University of Virginia. Then I worked for nine. Uh, so, so I switched my major five times between biology and chemistry. Um, <laughs> and uh, worked for nine years in biochemistry. And... Uh, uh, then went to grad school at Purdue. Um, did structural virology with Jack Johnson while he was at Purdue just before he left for Scripps. Did a postdoc at NIH with Alistair Stephen. And then I took a job at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. And I was in Oklahoma for 10 years. 
And um, it was kind of neat because I had absolutely no pressure on me to do what anyone else expected, and I got to do uh, virus assembly studies. And then um, I moved to Indiana. How long ago was that? 2008. So where did your interest in science come from way back? Mm. Um, well, my father was an aeronautical engineer and, and something of a polymath. And so uh, I got introduced to, to lasers in 1964. Uh, at some point or another, he decided he, he needed to figure out how a heart worked. So we, he, he dissected a pig's heart on the kitchen table. Uh, not something you should do in a kosher house. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, during uh, uh, the Apollo years, I had a whole wall of uh, uh, newspaper clippings. And it was kind of cool to stay up to midnight to watch the uh, moon landing. You, you probably did the yeah, same thing. Yeah, I, was, uh, I was in high school, yeah. Um, I was uh, a wee bit younger, but uh, it was incredible. And, yeah. and many years later to find out that Neil Armstrong screwed up what he was supposed to say when right. he first put, on, right. first put foot on the uh, moon. So Adam, if you were asked to go to Mars on a mission, would you go? Um, yeah, you asking? Yeah, no, no, not me. Right. If, if someone asks you, I have no say in the matter, but I understand they're going to go in five or so years. I couldn't, not, say, I couldn't possibly say no. You might not come back. <laughs> um, yeah, there is that. There is that problem. I saw how 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 they did it in the movie, so I'm sure it'll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to ask you that question. Where did your science interest come from? I really don't know. Okay. <laughs> when I was little, I used to mix things together, and I think that's the closest it could get to whether it was food or paint and glue, and mm -hmm. that was about it. So you were encouraged, right? I was encouraged. Sure. Um, and I had a bunch of lab experiences, like through undergrad, mm -hmm. so that was interesting. Okay, Adam, uh, last question before we move on. What made you come to Indiana from Oklahoma? Um, you? Tuli is pointing to herself. <laughs> Actually, Tuli was uh, instrumental in, in recruiting me. Um, in Oklahoma, I had really uh, hit a wall as to what I could do without interacting, having people there to interact with. Mm -hmm. I, I felt, uh, other than Jillian Air, I was pretty much on my own. Um, I had some great colleagues, but there weren't any other people doing virology or structural virology. And over here, um, Chen Kao was being recruited, and, and to give credit where it's due, he, he's the one who provided the name Capsid Club. Um, uh, the biochemistry uh, concentration, the biochemistry graduate program was being developed into a full department and I was being recruited for that. I would have people like Thule, people like Rich Hardy, people like Chang, people like Bogdan Dragnia. And since arriving here, I, I, I found the walls between departments are essentially uh, invisible. I have collaborators in chemistry and biology and it's fantastic. All right. Hey, Kathy, you think you could ask John the, the, these questions since you're always sure. down there. How sure. long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell us where you're from, your education and training. <clears throat> okay, simple. Um, so I was born outside of Los Angeles, California. I was an army brat and then um, ended up living in Virginia, but a different part than where Adam lived. I lived down near Blacksburg, Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech was or is. Uh, and I was an in undergraduate at Virginia Tech, and then I did my PhD at Virginia Tech working on bovine parvoviruses. Who was that with? Uh, Robert Bates. Um, so I moved from, then I moved on to Chapel Hill uh, working with Gail Wirtz at UNC. Uh, where I studied, rot um, not rotavirus replication, not yet, uh, vesicular stomatitis viruses and their replication using in vitro cell-free systems. Um, at that time, at the end of that postdoc journey, there was a person there in the public, uh, in the School of Public Health. 
he had just he had some rotavirus samples over there. He had cell lines that you could grow rotavirus in. At that point, uh, Mary Estes had just learned how you grow this virus using trypsin. Um, so I went over and got virus from him, cell lines from him, and the virus was able to grow very nicely. And what he did at that point was to um, basically, wherever it said VSV in any sort of protocol I had, I put rotavirus in, and it pretty much worked. Uh, <laughs> so I had an in vitro replication system going for rotavirus, um, and that was pretty much where I started as a, as a postdoc working on rotaviruses. But from that postdoc, um, this is where the story gets long, um, I went to University of South Florida uh, for several years in Tampa, and then I moved on to University of Miami. Uh, School of Medicine, um, and then a few years after that, I got a phone call from Al Kapikian at NIH asking if I wanted to go work on rotaviruses uh, in the Laboratory of Infectious Diseases. I went and did that for 20 years, um, and then I spent um, a couple of years after that at the University of Maryland until Thule came and found me at an ASV meeting and uh, <laughs> said, you really should come to Indiana. So here I am. So you've got two people to come here, is that right? No, I can't send them back. Really? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's neither very of us, good. <laughs> neither of us came with return uh, <laughs> addresses. Is there anyone else you, you convinced to come? Pranav. <laughs> really? Possibly. So John, what got you interested in science? Um, I, well, I guess I, I don't remember a, uh, a particular moment where I got interested in biology or microbiology, but I do remember being in a microbiology lecture, lecture class when I was a junior in college uh, in which my professor started talking about bacteriophages, and he was talking about T7 phage, and I thought that was fascinating, um, the mechanism of rep replication and how you regulate gene expression. Uh, during the replication of that virus, and I think I was pretty much hooked at that point. I'm curious about um, all these moves, right? Well, let's talk the last one. And why did you come to Indiana? Because you convinced them to, right? I, yeah, I, explain this to Lee. I, <laughs> okay, my side of the story. We were recruiting, and I was telling everyone at ASV, hey, if you know of anyone that's movable and interested in the position, let us know, spread the word. I was networking. Mm. And um, so I told him, I didn't really think he would be movable. Um, and then we exchanged some emails and we we're like, oh, he really does want to move. <laughs> so uh, you moved a lot. and I have moved a lot. A lot of people move frequently, but yeah. I think you're unusual. In, I in am that, unusual. Yeah. Is that, I'm told that often. But uh, Is there any... Do you just like to move around? I think it's uh, uh, attention deficit <laughs> disorder. Um, <laughs> it could be because I was a military brat a little bit. Maybe, too. yeah. So, you, you know. well, that's very interesting. It's a lot. I didn't know you were at Maryland for a while. Just a couple years. So the, I was at that meeting. Uh, yes. That's where I saw you as yeah. well, right? Yeah, he's supposed to be one of the co-organizers of next summer's ASV meeting. And he is now no longger doing that, but working on oh, having an Maryland. ASV meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's why you moved. <laughs> yeah. Watch out. If you get the meeting in 2024, <laughs> he may be. He may be. <laughs> Good to know. So he Good might know. end up doing his work in, in uh, 2024 here, right? Yeah. No, that's very good. Okay. Now we know where you're all from. Let's talk a little bit about science. And I'll start with you, Thule. You work on alpha viruses. I do. Are they from Alphaville? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know the reference. You know what Alphaville? It's an old science fiction movie. Anybody um, know Alphaville? It's like, yeah, the, the old people know it, right? <laughs> <clears throat> it's a great, great science fiction movie. I think it's black and white, right? And probably you wouldn't like it, but it's really good, right? Anyway, <laughs> whenever I see Alphaville, I think of Alphaville. Okay. Okay, so uh, you work on them because you did some training at... At Purdue, Purdue right. right. What about them do you like to work on? So our lab is interested in the assembly of alpha viruses. And what that really means is when the virus infects a host cell, so the cell that it's infected, how does it know to put all the pieces together to make new particles that can leave that cell and infect other cells? Well, the answer is it doesn't know anything, right? 
Well, that's true. It's not alive. But <laughs> what does it do to assemble itself? So what is an alpha virus? An example of one? You can answer it any way you like. Um, okay. So an alpha virus is a virus that's transmitted from a mosquito to a vertebrate, and it has a cyclical cycle, transmission cycle. Some examples would be chikungunya virus, Simbis virus, and Ross River virus. So which ones do you work on here? All, those three. All of them? Those three, okay. predominantly. And the reason I like them is when I first went to Purdue and saw the structure, um, Michael and Richard were showing us the structure of the core, and I thought it was really neat that you had all these pentagons and these hexagons arranged in this wonderful symmetrical pattern. And then when you look on the outside, you have these trimers, um, so these triangular shaped things that kind of look like broccoli on the surface, and those were also arranged with a certain pattern. And what was really cool about it, and as far as I know, this is still true for envelope viruses, it's really the only one where the outside um, triangular parts are interacting with those hexagon and pentamers that are inside on the core. Mm -hmm. And to me, I know viruses aren't alive, but if you're a virus and you're going inside a cell, why do you want to go through this extra layer um, of forming this assembling with such organization, not just in the core, not just in the spikes, but actually aligning how those assemblies mm -hmm. go together? And so there has to be a purpose. I don't know what the purpose is, um, but to me, I think that's really interesting. So I was talking about this with Joe this morning. What's your, yeah. Is that your name, right? Joe. Sorry. It's Joe Wong. Joe. I was talking about this with him. So for alpha viruses, mm -hmm. there's an icosahedrally ordered capsid, is that right? Yes. And the spikes interact. Yep. And, you know, I've always thought that the, that interaction gives the spikes icosahedral order, but he told me that on their own they can be ordered as they well. They can. So why do they need this interaction? I don't know. That's a good question, That's right? That's pretty interesting. So are you trying to answer it? We are. We're also trying to... So when we study assembly, that also means you have to study disassembly. Right, because you don't really know how well a particle is put together till you know how well you can take it apart. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what Ankur and you were saying, how you took everything apart in hopes to put it back together. Well, we didn't put it back together. Right, though. in hopes. <laughs> I had in hopes in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So you, you know, when you, we think it could be regulation, maybe when those because those uh, spikes on the surface are really important for binding and mm -hmm. entering a cell. But maybe that's a way to say, okay, now the core can fall apart. You don't want the core sure. to fall apart earlier, things like that. So can you reconstitute assembly, and like your G-protein thing, you reconstitute, can you reconstitute assembly entirely in vitro? Sort of. Right. So we can take um, capsid protein that's made in bacteria, and we can add any sort of single-stranded nucleic acid, so let's say a piece of RNA um, or DNA, and we can make the cores. And then if we take the cores and we... Um, uh, transfect them into cells that are expressing off of plasma the glycoproteins, mm -hmm. you actually get new virus particles that come out, and those viruses can then infect another cell. So our lab and Richard Kuhn's mm -hmm. lab um, both showed that. So the, you can package any RNA into the core? Single-stranded. But there's no sequence specificity It doesn't seem to be sequence or structure, and it has to be at least a minimum length of either 12 or 14 nucleotides. So how does, I presume no cellular RNAs are packaged, right, normally? Normally, no. Do we know why that distinction is made? No, there's, um, there are regions in the genome that have been identified as encapsidation signals. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, but why, and we have some mutants where we think that we are packaging host RNAs, um, but we don't know why. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I found this paper of yours. Yeah, and the first author is sitting right there. Yeah, she's your host. She's our host. So I thought you could explain it to us because she's we're here because of Jolene. Do you want this, Jolene to explain it? Well, she doesn't have a microphone, so you have to do it. We'll, we'll, have, ah. <laughs> we'll have her back. Just to, so there's palmito elation yeah. of TF protein. I don't know what TF is, but regulates localization and corporation. So yeah. can you break down, well, first, what's palmito elation? So palmitylation is the addition of an acyl chain. Um, and so let me back up and tell you what TF is. So sure. for the longest time, when you look at the genes in an alpha virus structural protein, you would have capsid and then your, and that was your um, capsid protein. And then you would have four genes that were associated with making the spike. So envelope three or E3, E2, 
a 6K gene in E1. And so E2 and E1 are for entry. And people just kind of forgot about 6K. And then, when was this, 2008, Firth discovered that there was actually a frame shifting, a ribosomal frame shifting in the minus one position. So 90, about 85 to 90% of the time, you would make the 6K protein. In the other 10 to 15% of the time, you would make this trans frame, hence TF, um, that was there. But what's really interesting is if you look at the virus particles that are coming out, they don't contain the 6K protein, the protein that's made the most. They instead contain this TF protein. So what Jolene set out to do, I think, this is maybe how it started, we wanted to know how come TF was ending up in the virus particle and not 6K. And what she found was that TF gets palmitylated. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the sites of where TF gets palmitylated is actually, those residues are still present in 6K, but for some reason, only TF is getting palmitylated. Once that protein gets palmitylated, it ends up at the plasma membrane, and then it gets incorporated in the particle. If it doesn't get palmitylated or doesn't have this modification, it doesn't go to the plasma membrane and doesn't end up in the particle. So we thought that was really okay. cool. Got it. And um, this was part of Jolene's thesis project, and now she's done, right? She is. It's sad. <laughs> I mean, it's good. I'm very happy, cool. but she'll be leaving the lab. Not for her, though. She's very happy, right? She probably is. Well, she <laughs> <laughs> We're all happy that she finished. Of course. And she's moving to Texas, I Texas heard. Texas a.m. She's going to do work on phages. I know. Very It'll exciting. Maybe we'll have a twiv from Texas. Yes. That would be cool. A twiv from Texas. Natural literary. All right. So we'll see this question. If you could tell Tony Fauci about one project from your lab, your meet Tony in an elevator. Oh, geez. What would it be? You don't have a lot of time because he's a busy person, right? I, I feel like I can't do that because that's like saying, which is your favorite child? Uh -huh. I understand. Yeah. You know, I just, I can't do that. That's Especially fine. if my children are here. <laughs> yeah. Well, even if they weren't, they would hear it later. So. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that. In fact, I often preface that with, I understand that you can't be favored, but most people go ahead anyway. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to you. So Adam, I love this on your website, little, a little haiku. Well, it's not, it's not correct. It's, we take viruses apart, we put them back together, we make them make mistakes, and then that should end it right there. <laughs> that was very nice. Did you write that? Um, either I or Joe did. I think it's. I think it started with me. Okay, Joe's pointing to me, <laughs> passing the blame. So um, I'm a bit of a frustrated physicist. I really like the processes that are involved in virus assembly. I, I, I liken it to taking a, a deck of cards, throwing it in the air, and having it land looking like the Taj Mahal, time after time after time. And, and the coolest thing is um, when you try to take a virus, not the coolest thing, but one of the other odd features is when you try to take a virus apart, it's like throwing a ball in the air and having it get stuck in the air. They don't fall apart. There's a huge barrier to dissociation for many of the viruses. And so I, I, um, we're actively investigating what are what is the basis for this hysteresis, the gap between assembly and disassembly? And um, we're finding that during assembly, um, we had always thought you always came up with perfect uh, capsids. But uh, uh, as I said before, one of the great things about uh, Indiana is all the collaborations. We've been looking at single particles and using uh, uh, nanofluidics or... Uh, really sophisticated mass spec, we're finding there's a lot of particles that have a few extra pieces or are missing a few pieces, and they'll eventually fill in. When you take a virus apart, they get stuck part way apart and then eventually fall the rest of the way apart. So building mathematical models of this process for assembly and for disassembly can relate to the biology, <coughs> but also understanding that if we can mess up the assembly process, we have a whole new approach to developing antivirals. And it's now an approach that's being taken by um, a lot of companies. So it's, it's really, uh, it's exciting. It's actual, 
it actually is translational research. And um, it's also fun. So you can have an anti a drug that interferes with assembly, and this, you're saying this could be developed as an antiviral, right? Well, it doesn't interfere. It doesn't mm -hmm. prevent assembly. Mm -hmm. It just encourages it. Encourages it. So explain how that would work. So you have a normal assembly line. You start off with pieces. You get a car at the end. That assembly line moves at a quarter mile an hour. Let's speed it up a little bit. You'll get more cars, but there'll be more mistakes. Let's speed it up by, say, a factor of a 1,000. Now that assembly line is moving at 250 miles an hour, you are going to be lucky to get a steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you look at what these misassembled particles look like, instead of a nice spherical icosahedral particle, um, they look like crap. <laughs> they're... they're uh, Hexagonal sheets, there's tubes, there are strange looking bags, they're incomplete particles. They're not viruses. Mm -hmm. and so how can a drug accelerate this process? Um, when you're building a virus, when you're building a complicated uh, um, complex biochemically, if you build it with really strong interactions, a mistake gets stuck. So normally a virus assembles by a series of weak interactions, so any mistakes can anneal in and out. Um, these drugs do two things. First off, they stimulate uh, assembly by putting the uh, capsid protein in an assembly active state. And second off, they stabilize protein-protein interactions, so they strengthen the association by often tremendous amounts, and speed up the assembly <coughs> often by tremendous amounts. And so any mistake that's put in place gets locked in place. And, and the third feature of this is sometimes by sitting right at a protein-protein interface, they screw up the geometry. And so I like to talk in analogy, so I'll put one more analogy in. Um, if you remember your, your junior high school shop project of building a picture frame and it was supposed to be 45 degree angles and so many kids put in 50 degree angles and it didn't quite work out right? Well, you do that in, in a virus with 240 uh, subunits, the pieces don't fit together. How would you identify such compounds? Do you go one by one or do you have some kind of screen that you would use? Um, so we developed a fluorescent... Uh, screen. We uh, purify capsid protein, we put a fluorophore on it, and when um, we have free capsid protein, this thing is brightly fluorescent. When it assembles, when the capsid assembles, the fluorescence is quenched by 95 percent. You can, you can see it by eye. So you can go through a screen of hundreds of thousands of compounds really quickly. Mm -hmm. And what virus did you use for this? This is all hepatitis Epi. B. And so you think that in some in X number of years we'll have antivirals available? That um, I think Gilead has a, a HIV specific antiviral. Is that um, assembly a core assembly interference that, that attacks uh, the the uh, gag protein? Um, I think John. I know Johnson and Johnson and uh, Roche. Um, and, and a company I was involved in as well are all in um, phase one, phase two trials mm -hmm. um, cool. developing these molecules. So um, why hepatitis B virus? So as a graduate student, I can make a short story long or a long story short. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> As a graduate student, I started working on the process of assembly. I post, when I postdoc with Alistair Stephen at NIH, I started working on hepatitis B. And um, my, it, was, it was a failed postdoc. I'd never got the crystal structure, but we did get about 10 papers out along the way. That's a failed postdoc. I didn't, get, I didn't <laughs> succeed in my project. Um, but we... Uh, uh, and I had a great deal of fun, mainly, <laughs> mainly at Alistair's expense. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, hepatitis B assembly and disassembly turned out to be extremely labile and extremely tractable. 
when I started my position at Oklahoma, um, there were two projects I was going to work on, hepatitis B, because I assumed it was going to be fundable, mm -hmm. and cowpichlorotic model virus, because it's an incredible uh, assembly problem, and I assumed it would be easy to work with. It turns out that hep B was easy to work with and fundable. CCMV was easy to work with, but hard to get good protein and very difficult to fund. There you go. Now, hep B is also a medical issue still, right? Huge. So about 240 million people have chronic hep B. About 2 billion people have at one time or another been infected by it. And about 780,000 people die each year. So these antivirals the would be good to, to uh, get infection out of the chronically infected people, right? The yeah. goal is to come up with a cure for chronic infection. Mm. So it might be your, your work, huh, that does this? Um, it might be, might be my work that contributes to this, but... So what would you tell Tony Fauci? If, <laughs> or you uh, can't... You other, can't than, other than just fund me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um... Just tell them about one project. You, you don't necessarily have to have it the most exciting project. or Just one project you're going to tell them about. Um, I would talk about uh, uh, the importance of uh, structural virology and biophysics towards developing uh, translational approaches. Mm. Sounds like what we've been talking about here, right? I'm, I'm sort of a one-track mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. John, you, your interest is rotaviruses. Rotavirus, yep. Why? Because I guess, you know, this is a common theme. I always ask people why, but it's because you encounter it at some time and you love it and you continue, right? Right. And that's why you continue. Yeah. So um, you, you've done, you've worked on a lot of aspects of rotaviruses. Yeah. So which one right now is, is exciting to you? Um, the reverse genetic system was developed, uh, uh, you know, a full plasmid-based reverse genetic system was re uh, reported for rotavirus in January. And so... Uh, this year? Yeah. So about half the lab is working on um, optimizing, uh, using that technology to make mutant strains of rotaviruses for other projects in the laboratory. So that must have been really exciting, right? It's very exciting. You know, I think that's been somewhat uh, a challenge for the rotavirus field for about 20 years. Um, and um, um, I have a first year graduate student, Asha, in the laboratory, and she got it to work three times in a row. And I'm still not convinced she recognizes just how many years of effort went into trying to get a reverse <laughs> genetic system. Because, um, But nonetheless, yeah, what, it works very nicely. So is it fair to say that Rota was the last major virus lacking a, an infectious. <clears throat> I think people problem. would probably agree that certainly one of the last um, viruses to have a, you know, a, a full uh, plasmid-based yeah. system developed for it. So Kathy, on the last TWIV, Theodora called it an IMC. Remember? Right. I was trying to remember what her term for it was. I like that. Yeah. Does anybody know what an IMC problem? is? <laughs> yeah, I just said it. <laughs> Everybody comes up with their own nomenclature. Yeah. So what do you want to do with this technology? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, it kind of opens Pandora's box. There's been, uh, I think every rotavirus lab in the world has been sort of thinking of all these experiments that they would do if they were able to manipulate the rotavirus genome. So uh, there's many uh, things that could be done. One of the things that we're trying to actually do in the laboratory, which takes us back to Tony Fauci, I guess. Um, this is what you would tell him? Uh, I think we would work in this direction. Um, <laughs> but um, I think most people know that there's a rotavirus vaccine um, that's been introduced in the U.S., very effective uh, and being used in different parts of the world anymore. Um, but And now we recognize noroviruses as the next primary cause of acute gastroenteritis in young children. And our thought is to, uh, now that we have a reverse genetics system for rotaviruses, to re-engineer the genome to introduce uh, an additional open reading frame in which we would uh, introduce uh, the capsid protein for norovirus, or at least a part of it. Uh, and that way, uh, you could basically replace um, the vaccine strains that are currently in use with a vaccine strain that's really inducing protective antibodies responses against uh, one more. So it be a double vaccine. Yeah, 
and you, so it doesn't change the childhood yeah. immunization schedule, which is packed full now and so forth. Um, so, th you know, I mean, that's our dream. That's what ASHA uh, will be doing. So this uh, is perfect because the same target, right? The gut mucosa. Yeah. And, you know, the anti-vax people always say we have too many vaccines. So if we can narrow this down. That's right. Down, that's right. That was the idea was just to try to double lot. up. Uh, so do you, is is uh, rotavirus eradicable in people? No, uh, I don't. Yeah. So and and I the the protection you get from rotavirus vaccines is certainly is not a sterilizing uh, protection. So the virus is still out there. It's just uh, the severity or the symptoms that you get. Um, well, it's primarily asymptomatic or uh, a clinical subclinical um, if you've been vaccinated mm -hmm. in general. So we would have to use this vaccine forever? It's forever. Uh, and that, of course, raises other issues about the cost and uh, how this is being funded, not so much in the U.S., but in the developing world where the vaccines needed more. But there are no animal reservoirs, are there, of human strains? Mm, we can debate that a little bit. Um, there's some evidence that you do get certain genes moving over um, through reassortment mm -hmm, into right. the rotavirus uh, genome. But by and large, it looks like um, there's somewhat of a co-speciation of uh, human rotaviruses with human species, and they've optimized um, to grow um, as a dual somewhat. Um, so we don't see a lot of it, evidence for it. So this is, brings up an interesting issue, you know, with, uh, with polio is about to be eradicated. Yeah. We can't really work on it uh, anymore. Um, you know, the people who work on hep C are worried that funding is going to dry up because we have great yeah. antivirals now. So do you, do you have similar worries about rotavirus? <clears throat> so I think, I mean, that's a very legitimate concern right now. Uh, obviously, this always seems to happen right after a vaccine that comes out, spe especially one that's very successful is the idea that we don't need to actually uh, look at those viruses anymore or be concerned because we're all safe. I think one of the concerns with rotaviruses right now is it, it is an RNA virus and it can evolve through shift and drift. Uh, and we don't really know what the pressure that's being imposed upon the landscape of rotaviruses that's circulating out there by the constant use, use of a certain fixed type of vaccine may do to uh, the efficacy of the vaccine over a long term. Uh, long term. So certainly surveillance studies have continued uh, and probably need to continue. Um, um, protection is great, but it's not perfect. We still see some kids going to hospitals and I think you'll, in various hospital studies, you'll see them monitoring what type of rotaviruses are sending kids to the hospital, even though they've been vaccinated to find out if they're some sort of an escape or, or an unusual strain. But so far, we really haven't seen that. Uh, so the vaccine looks quite good. So you said that with, with vaccination or multiple natural infections, eventually the, the infections are asymptomatic, mm -hmm. but they keep recurring, right? And so what, do we understand that? And can we design a vaccine that would prevent infection? Prevent infection. <clears throat> you know, so it's in, and you probably can speak to this better than me, but uh, th that always seems to be somewhat of a challenge of getting uh, sterilizing protection from vaccines in enteric situations. Um, those, the antibody responses, the protective responses always seem to somewhat wane in, in that mm. particular environment. Um, yeah, certainly for OPV, polio. Yeah, so same thing, I, I don't, yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if it's really possible or, or not. Um, and I don't really know why, for example, if you have a measles virus vaccine, that seems to be much more forever, uh, as opposed yeah. to, uh, um, a, a rotavirus one where we know the rotavirus vaccine tends to wane after a, a couple of years. Yeah, sure. But then if you get a natural infection, it's not usually considered to be life-threatening. So it's, it's not a particular, it's not the same risk. It just seems that vaccinating forever, having to do it, there must, there must be a better way. You would right? think, right? you would think. Uh, but as you said, measles vaccine, one shot lifetime protection. Right. But, you know, not all viruses are like that. Um, you've also worked on other aspects, right? Of, right. I think I remember uh, at an ASV talk, uh, really interested in the polymerase in the virus yeah. particle, right? Um, my, one of my true loves is, in fact, the rotavirus RNA polymerase. Um, um, several years ago, uh, as 
part of collaboration with Steve Harrison, we had solved the structure of the rotavirus RNA polymerase. And it opens another uh, set of experiments that we're hoping to get back into, especially with um, the structure groups here, um, looking at um, uh, essentially how that polymerase is being regulated. Rotavirus polymerase is very interesting because you can, if you, you can purify the polymerase um, to homogeneity and you can add the template RNA to it with all the nucleotides and so forth to it and nothing, it won't do a thing. It, it will recognize the template, but it will not replicate the template. But if you add the core protein to it, the major protein that forms a shell around it, um, that triggers a signal within the polymerase that uh, allows initiation and elongation. And we still don't understand what's going on other than there's some sort of allosteric uh, pulse being delivered to the uh, initiation site of the polymerase that must some, cause some sort of conformational change so you get the initiating nucleotide uh, that then uh, allows uh, initiation and elongation to take place. That's still my favorite project. It's hard to approach yeah, that. I got him to say his favorite project. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> So how many other virologists are here at IU? Do you have a rough idea? Pranav, Rich, Chang, Bogdan, Trevor, Five, Martin, six. Steve. Wow. Seven um, others. Did I so, forget so anyone? Have, uh, I'm sorry if I forgot. You have yeah. nine total. Uh, David Giedrock doing uh, Coronas. Yeah. So we have a lot of people doing biophysics on viruses. Mm-hmm but not, they're not traditional virologists. <laughs> okay. But there are others still. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to go back and ask John if you ever ran into Tony Fauci in the elevator, and what did you say to him? <laughs> <laughs> I did run into Tony Fauci more than once, and it's usually he was doing these fast, uh, almost uh, umbrella series of pop-ins to your laboratory in which you would come in and you would basically uh, have 30 seconds to really kind of tell him what your story was. And we, we certainly told him about the, uh, the concept of using reverse genetic system to try to make this dual uh, norovirus, rotavirus vaccine. That one people understand at all levels. A little bit harder to get them to buy off on uh, allosteric regulation of the <laughs> RNA polymerase by the you, you capsid might, protein. You might be surprised. So th anyway, the, having so many people working on viruses at one place is great. You should be, uh, you're lucky to have that because not all, and you have at least two people working on double-stranded RNA viruses, mm -hmm. right? That's just in itself is great, which brings the point that, you know, we had lots of choices for TWIV and each of these individuals could have their own podcast with us. Uh, so, but the point is to highlight what's going on here for people who are not here. It's really important to do. So now we have some questions that um, may, may take a little more thought. Yes. And we're going to throw, Kathy, you, you can start with one and pick anyone. Sure. Uh, Tuli, if you hadn't become a scientist, what would you do? So there was a short time in my life that I thought I would be a social worker. That's Very short, huh? Yeah, I realized I did not have the patience for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I had this desire to want to help people, especially children, and then I was like, oh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. How about you, Adam? Um, cabinetry, uh, woodworking. Really? I just like the uh, detail. You still do, you do that as a hobby? Uh, no, as a hobby, I cook. I, I, uh, working with wood requires more space, more time, and uh, longer times. Cooking, I, if, I, if it isn't done in a couple hours, it's burnt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Blue Apron, you can do it in less than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Free I appreciate, I, I, I appreciate the challenge. As a <laughs> I understand, but I hear it's good. I, I know it's good. I've tried it. So I think we had someone else who said woodworking cabinetry also. Yes, I, can't, I remember. can't remember who but that was. But that's two scientists now. That's interesting. Uh, my grandfather was a carpenter. Yeah. Um, I just, I like the smell. I like uh, the idea of yeah. the precision, or I like the precision. How about John? What would you do? I think I was going to be a used book, uh, have a used bookstore. Um, I thought that would be really fun. Yeah. Do you like to read a lot? 
Uh, I like to read, but I never do. You know how that goes. Uh, but it takes I, away the question about have you read any good books? Well, that, you have to, so, so right now I'm reading the uh, manual to take the driver's test in Indiana because so good books. I don't know, but I really need to read that book. And so but, it can't be that hard, right? It, it shouldn't be, right? When did you get here? Uh, August, first week of August. And, and you're not driving. Uh, or you, you, want well, to, you don't want to answer I don't that have question. to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how about you? Have you read any books, good books lately? I think the last book I read was about a year ago. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember what it was? Yeah. Um, Small Great Things, is that what it's called? Um, it was, yeah, it was good. Small Great Things. Is that what it's called? Do you know what book I'm talking about? No. Oh, um, it was, it's a story about a nurse um, who has to take care um, of, she's African American and she takes care of a baby, but the parents are um, not happy with her taking care of the child. So it has like some race relations in there. Mm. It was quite okay. Good. Kathy, go ahead. Uh, with another question. Uh, Adam, what do you know today that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Hmm. I seem to know less today than I knew when I was starting <laughs> up. Um, I, I might have. I was very fortunate. I I I, I lucked into good projects early on, and that was that was. Um, Anything that was very fortunate. Just the way you would do science, or well, you know, mentor I people, or let me let me move back. If I if I say what, <laughs> by the time I was starting my own lab, I was uh, forty years old. But when I was an undergraduate, what I really wanted to be more than anything else was cool, and I I learned I'm not cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's and okay. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a, that's really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> How about Maybe. you, John? What would you... Well, it's interesting. So if I could do it all over again, I would learn a lot more about computer programming. <laughs> uh, however, at the time I was in college, you know, we were doing, we had boxes of cards, uh, punch cards. And so I'm not sure I could have actually learned more programming at that point, but it certainly would have been helpful at that point to know more about programming. What else do we have here? Let's see. Uh, did did you get to answer this last one? I forgot. What was the question we just asked? What do you what would I do yeah. you differently? So the learned? question is, yeah. if, what, what do you know today that you wish you knew when you started out? Yeah. I think when I started science, I thought I wouldn't have to read and write so much, um, <laughs> and I thought I could just do experiments in the lab, and I could make figures, and that was fine. Um, so I guess I wish I was forewarned that I would have to write a lot and I should pay attention to English class and maybe try a little harder. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but you, in fact, you had to read and write back then, even in the beginning, right? I did. I didn't necessarily put a hundred percent effort. Good to hear. <laughs> I do now. I understand. Yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, let's see. Uh, we went through the books one. Oh, here's a good one. Adam, what do you do for fun? Um, cooking, cooking. <laughs> eating, <laughs> science. Um, actually, uh, cooking is the hobby. Okay. And um, life has been a little busy uh, past few years trying to keep up with the science and keep up with Every activity associated with the lab, so. No excuses now. No excuses. You said cooking, that's fine. Oh. It's okay. And even if you haven't cooked in two years, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> haven't cooked since last night. Okay. Um, John, what about you? I walk my dog. That's pretty much. And then I watch Adam walk you like his dog. You like walking your dog? I do like walking my dog. How long do you take to walk your dog? <clears throat> it's usually, well, it depends on whether the dog is deciding she needs to walk downtown uh, to greet all the people. And so that's 
usually about every other day. Um, but it's about a mile down and a mile back. So. Yeah, it's a good walk. Yeah, it's a good walk. So her. no phone calls, no email, right? Uh, nothing. Uh, we head for the That's bagel great. shop. We order a uh, plain bagel with cream cheese, and we split it half with the dog, and then we walk <laughs> back. <laughs> Everyone's happy. My dog has celiac. She doesn't uh, handle mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Truly, what do you do for fun? Oh, we didn't ask you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I think... I'd say in the last five or ten years, I just play with my kids, and I do whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah. Do you have fun doing that? I do, actually. I like it. Do you ever bring them to the lab? Um, who's asking? Is biosafety asking? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> They're not even going to hear this, so don't worry about it. Yeah. How old are they? Now they are 11 and almost 14. You think either will be a scientist? No. One has told me um, that she wants to be a chef. So maybe I'll send her to Adam's cooking school. Um, and the other one said, you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I really like math more than I like science. And I said, that's fine. But she also likes to build, so she's thinking of being an architect, an engineer, um, or an artist. Cool. But she's 11. <laughs> yeah, she'll change her mind. That's yeah. Fine. Exactly. But that's okay. But you, just by having a science environment in the house is good. Mm -hmm. Even if she's not a scientist, she'll know something which is she important, mm -hmm. right? It's really important. Um, now, so here's a hard question. What's the one thing that you have done that has given the most to science as a field? I want all of you to answer this. <coughs> and uh, let's start with Adam. Okay. When I was a grad student, again, I can make a short story long. Um, when I was a grad student, I, I, my thesis project wasn't working, and so I started um, doing assembly problems rather than looking at the crystal structure of uh, Notomora virus or trying to solve the crystal structure of Notomora. And there wasn't anything in the literature that really described uh, what virus assembly should look like. So I built a... Um, a, a, a thermodynamic kinetic model, master equation model of virus assembly. And that ruined my life. <laughs> That's really what, been, what I've been doing for the last uh, 25 okay. years. Tuli, how about you? I don't know. I have to think a little more. Maybe okay. John should go. <laughs> I will go. I, I actually think it, it's not so much anything I've done. I think it's providing the opportunity for young people to come into your laboratory. And it's, and it's kind of that progression of sending out a new wave of young scientists to go start their own labs. And do, that's what I'm most proud of in terms of my accomplishments is making that possible or being part of that process. I think, again, mine isn't like John, not, not necessarily what I've done, but when I was at Purdue, I feel like I was a, a very strong bridge between the molecular people and the structure people. Mm -hmm. um, and I could, I guess, talk two different languages because of my background. And I felt, and I could be wrong, but I felt like I got a lot more people from the Kuhn lab to talk to the Rossman people and the Rossman people to talk to the Kuhn lab. So a lot of this interdisciplinary sort of work. And I think that that's carried over <coughs> at IU as well. So I, I seem to get people to talk to each other. I would accuse you of being a facilitator of, of conversations. So I might not do much science, but I get other people <laughs> to do science. And she certainly knows how to recruit virologists. Yeah. So, Kathy, let's do one more. Okay. And that is our, the one that's not on here. Okay. That is, um, so, so I, I can ask of a sp specific person. So, John, if you could go to dinner with anybody... Living or not living. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you choose to go to dinner with? Hmm. I, can I pass this to Thule? She passed the last one to me. Sure. <laughs> sure. Thule, go for it. I think I would want to go to dinner with, like, um, a composer, like someone like Bach or Beethoven. Not that I'm, like, some great classical music person, but... They have written so many pieces, and when you learn them, so like when I learn them and as my kids are learning them, they're very mathematical. 
and how they are and how the music is. And I just think, did they know that when they were doing it? Or how did like they get inspired to write so many things? So I just think that's kind of cool. That's a good one. I like that. How about Mozart? Would you like to go to dinner with him? I'd go with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> how about Adam? Go to dinner with him? <laughs> <laughs> Good. A second prize to Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> he does have cooking as a hobby. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I think my, my answer of John Stewart just pales to Beethoven <laughs> and Mozart. <laughs> oh, but that's a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I would be interested in talking to some of the political people who are supposed to be, uh, who have a chance of running the country in the future. Mm -hmm. And he would be one of them. Hmm? Who, John Stewart? John or? Stewart might not be one of them, but he'd be a really amusing person to have at the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about you? John. John. Back Dan. to me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, there, there are many options. I would probably go out with someone like Stephen King or someone like that. I'm a little bit curious just about the personality that's involved in writing the books that he writes. <laughs> but, but I'm also deeply curious on how someone can be so prolific and um, turning out the number of pages because I struggle so much just getting <laughs> one page written on a normal day that I'm, I'm just amazed by these individuals who can just turn it out like it's um, a copy machine. I'm just, I'm amazed by that. So. Who would you go to dinner with? Uh, I've, I've been asked before, oh, I don't and remember. the answer is uh, Albert Einstein. I would really like to tell him about viruses, because <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't know that much, mm -hmm. and um, it would be fun. Um, so he, he just seems to me like a brilliant, thoughtful scientist, and it would be interesting to uh, be able to talk to someone like that. Kathy, how about you? I'm going to pass. <laughs> so, so, Vincent, there's, there's a physical virology Gordon conference where a significant fraction of the people there really are physicists. And, and their view of virology is a little different than a traditional virologist. I'm sure. I'm sure. And, and I think you'd get a kick out of it. Yeah, it would be interesting. It's yeah. in Ventura, California, January 2019. <laughs> I'll invite you. Should we do a TWIV there? Yes. Would you do it? Yeah, of course. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll answer. I think I've said this in the past. Um, maybe Marie Curie or yes. Rosalind Franklin, some famous women in science who oh, had Rosalind it. Rosalind would be interesting. Yes. Yeah. You could ask her, why did you let them take your data? Exactly. <laughs> she, she didn't. They stole it. They stole it. <laughs> she locked it away, right? She didn't have any reason to distrust them from what it's I amazing understand. you publish a paper and you didn't do any of the experiments it's amazing did you, did you see their 1956 paper right next to Don Casper's paper Don Casper showed a, a procession photograph saying viruses are at least cube uh, spherical viruses are at least cubic probably icosahedral mm -hmm. and the next paper is Crick and Watson saying wouldn't it be cool if they were really icosahedra? <laughs> and it's a it's a lovely thought piece. Yes, yes, I. I've but seen there's that no one, data. Yeah. No data. Yeah. So it's uh, it was a common theme in what they published, right? It's amazing. <laughs> and remember, Jim Watson was one of the people on that slide I showed yeah. today. Can you name a scientist? And Jim Watson was one of them. All right. Well, you know, this is uh, about the time we. Wrap up with the normal TWIV, right? We mm -hmm. usually start about 2 o'clock, so this <laughs> right. is the right time. I know everybody wants to leave, so we will wrap this up. And I want to tell you, you can find TWIV at microbe.tv, and you can send emails and questions, comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. And we, uh, if you are interested, you can support us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways that you can do that. I want to thank all of my guests today. Tuli Mukopadi. No, okay. that's no good. <laughs> I wrote it down. How do you say it? Makupadi. Makupadi? That was one of them, and I have to get the other one later. Tuli Makupadi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate for your coming. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. 
Thank Adam, you, Kathy. Adam Zlotnick, thank you so much. Thank you. For coming. Uh, John Patton, thank Enjoyed you so it. much. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. And um, as I was with remembering who I might want to have dinner with, I think in Brazil you had beer at the TWIV. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, you've done two twibs there, but I, I think I remember you mean seeing. around the table? Yeah. All right. Well, that, that could be. Check it out. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank Jolene Ramsey for helping to arrange this. I don't know if you know this, but uh, this year we had a, a haiku contest on yeah. twib. And Jolene was the winner. <laughs> and here's the first part of her haiku. It's okay if I read it? Self-assembly, sampling each other, stochastic subunits form metastable cores. Might as well finish it. The, <laughs> the virus, scattered seeds dormant, inert till host encountered, a life redefined. So that was the winner. And the name of that episode was Scattered Seeds Seed Dormant. Dormant. You told me when you saw that title, you knew you had won, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did you win? What, uh, I won a copy of the book of viruses and illustrated by Marilyn Lucing. Right. Viruses. Okay. Well, thank you very much for doing it. Thanks to Indiana University and Adam for hosting me. Uh, I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV. And I want to thank the audience for coming. I appreciate it. We know you have better things to do. So we appreciate your time. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>